I've been trying to devote myself to my husband with sincerity since we got married. Even though we didn't have kids, I've been trying hard for my husband and his family. My husband, who called our 25 years together, boring. Fine, if you say so. I'll let you go. It's too late for regrets. You should suffer all you want. I am Jennifer, turning 50 this year. Living with my husband James, just the two of us. We're a couple without children. At the beginning of our marriage, we both wanted kids and tried various things. But due to my husband's busy work, we couldn't regularly go for infertility treatment. It seemed the cause of infertility was more on his side, and I wished he'd be more proactive about treatment. But I couldn't pressure him too much, so I kept silent. It was difficult to talk about kids or retirement with him, as he would suddenly become moody. Eventually, we both passed 40. About having kids. Enough. Drop it. And so, we chose to live our lives as a couple. But I really wanted children. There was a struggle before choosing this path. However, there's no point in blaming my husband now. So, I decided to do what I can as a wife for my husband. Go to my parents' house this weekend. They have a favor to ask. What kind of favor? Don't know. I have work on Saturday. His parents would summon me like this almost every week. They didn't care about my schedule. However, my husband said, You're just a part-timer. Get someone to cover for you. Dismissing my work like it was nothing. Ten years since giving up on having children. My husband now saw me not as a wife, but purely as a maid or servant. I knew arguing would only lead to more trouble. All right. I'll drop by after work on Saturday. I'll be late, but that's okay, right? His parents' house was far from both our home and my workplace. Just take the day off. I can't just take off on short notice. What's more important, family or work? He wouldn't listen to me. Thinking back, he's been like this since we got married. He believes a wife should always prioritize her husband's demands. It feels like I'm caring for a child I never had. Fine. I gave in and arranged to switch my work shift. And on Saturday, I was at his parents' house from morning. Jennifer, can you handle this? Mother-in-law Linda indifferently handed me a replacement light bulb. Yes. Probably a light bulb had gone out, and she found it too much trouble to replace herself. Summoned? Just for a light bulb? <sighs> I sighed as I replaced it. A task that takes less than a minute. To think I traveled over an hour for this made me angry. After replacing it, I approached Linda. It's done. Okay, now help John with something. Linda said without even looking at me. Then sort out these old books. And father-in-law John called me over. A room piled high with books. Likely John's collection. But why doesn't he sort his own things? I cleaned and dust-covered books and stored them on the shelf. Sorting hundreds of books was more work than I expected. How does John, living on an old-age pension, afford all these books? I wondered as the clock hit 4 p.m. I had to get home soon to prepare dinner, or my husband would get grumpy. Excuse me. I should be going now. I bid farewell to my parents-in-law and left. Neither of them thanked or saw me off. Despite my doubts and suspicions, I've somehow maintained a relationship with my husband and parents-in-law. I've tried to comply with unreasonable demands as much as possible. But there were things that just didn't go as planned. It was about children with James. From the beginning of our marriage, the parents-in-law were not pleased that we couldn't have children. Jennifer, no child yet? I want to see my grandchild soon. I remember the parents-in-law always asking me for a grandchild whenever they saw me. Both my husband and I thought there was no need to rush, so I ambiguously smiled and played it off. However, after five years of marriage without children, the impatient parents-in-law confronted me. Jennifer, 
Can you not have children? Yes, it's strange to have no kids after five years. They asked me. It was hard being questioned like that, especially since recent tests showed the cause of infertility was on my husband's side. No, John, that's... As I tried to explain. Don't be so hard on Jennifer, Dad and Mom. She's having a hard time, too. My husband defended me. Looking back, he probably just wanted to hide that he was the cause. But at that time, I was happy that he stood up for me. Gradually, my husband stopped pursuing treatment, and I stopped going to the hospital. We never declared we won't have children, but gradually the parents-in-law stopped pressuring for a grandchild. And the gap between me and the parents-in-law deepened over the years. I tried to bridge that gap, responding to their calls without complaint, but after all that help, not even a word of thanks. Instead, they acted as if it was only natural for me to do these things. John and Linda seemed cold to me. That's because they're disappointed about not seeing their grandchild. But that's not my fault, right? Huh? It's your responsibility, since you couldn't have them. But that's... I stopped mid-sentence. I thought it wasn't right to blame him for the infertility. Anyway, Dad and Mom seem to rely on you, so please continue to help out. My husband acted as if he had no part in this. I started to think that maybe it was time to reevaluate this relationship. One day, while cleaning my husband's room, I found an unfamiliar envelope on his study desk. Usually at home, I would go through all the mail that arrived, but I didn't recognize this envelope. It was already opened, so my husband had seen its contents. Out of curiosity, I looked at the document inside. What is this? $20,000? It was a bill for a debt my husband seemed to have taken on. I felt dizzy at the amount. I had never imagined that he was in debt without my knowledge. He was contributing a fixed amount to our household each month, and there were no signs of him wasting money. I need to ask him about this soon, I thought, and quietly waited for him to come home that day. He returned at 9 p.m., Maybe he had worked overtime again. Usually, I would say, thanks for your hard work, but I couldn't feel that way today. Welcome home. I need to talk to you. Right, after I get back. What is it? He sounded irritated. What about dinner? I'm hungry. Sit down first. It's important. He threw his bag roughly and sat down, loosening his tie. I presented him with the debt bill I had found earlier. Explain this to me. What is this? Don't go through my stuff without permission. It was just lying there on the desk. I didn't snoop around. My husband wouldn't look at me, just sat there with his elbows on the table, silent. More importantly, what did you use this $20,000 for? Do you have a plan for repaying it? I kept pressing him with questions. Stop nagging. Just be quiet. I'm family. Why would you secretly go into debt? I was filled with distrust at my husband's dishonest attitude. How could he act this way, hiding a $20,000 debt from his wife? I was on the verge of exploding with anger. Then my husband let out a heavy sigh. <sighs> Being with you feels suffocating. He glared at me, but I didn't back down. What does that have to do with the debt? Then he said something definitive. Living these 25 years of marriage, it's been a truly dull life. That's why I spent the money for a change of pace. Got a problem with that? I felt as if all the energy had drained from my body. Dull? What was the meaning of all I had done for my husband until now? What do you mean? Haven't I always devoted myself to you and your family? How can you say such awful things? For the first time since our marriage, I raised my voice at my husband. Don't act like you're doing me any favors. What you've done isn't anything special. He yelled back at me just as loudly. Just be quiet and listen to what I say. At his selfish words, I finally made up my mind. Enough. It's useless talking to you. 
Let's get a divorce. At the mention of divorce, my husband's eyes flickered with a hint of surprise. Divorce? Just like that? It's not easy. I've reached my limit. I looked him straight in the eye and said it clearly. He sneered at me, probably thinking I wasn't serious. Divorce? You think you can live on your own with your part-time job salary? He slammed his fist on the table, directing his anger at me. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. I said that and handed him the divorce papers I had prepared just in case. I never thought I'd actually use them. He seemed quite shocked to see the divorce papers. Don't worry about me. Just sign here. I've already filled out my part, please. Why did he think I couldn't live on my own? I'm a pharmacist, even if I work part-time. I could easily earn enough for myself if I worked full-time. In fact, my current workplace has even offered me a full-time position. Please sign quickly. He held the pen with trembling fingers. Finally, this life was coming to an end. I felt a sense of relief. That weekend, my husband must have talked to his parents about the divorce. They soon came rushing to our house. Jennifer, what's this about divorce? After all the trouble you've caused James. When had I ever caused trouble for my husband? It's a decision between husband and wife. What trouble are you talking about? I asked calmly. It's about the child. You couldn't have one, but James stayed with you. John yelled at me loudly. His anger reminded me of my husband, and I thought, they really are father and son. What an awful person. I never liked you to begin with. Linda spoke as if she was joining John in the confrontation. Infertility wasn't my fault. The issue was with James, but he refused to go to the hospital, so there was nothing we could do about treatment. As I explained, the parents-in-law looked surprised. Beside me, my husband was just looking dejected. Besides, secretly going into debt without telling me, I can't continue living with you. Debt? I didn't know about that. The parents-in-law seemed unaware of the debt and looked at my husband in surprise. Didn't you know? That makes sense. James has been sending you quite a bit of money, after all. I had found it odd. Despite living on old age pension, the parents-in-law's lifestyle was extravagant. John was buying expensive books almost every week, adding to his collection, and Linda frequently dined at upscale restaurants. They might have savings from their working days, but it still seemed too extravagant. For ordinary employees and housewives, the amount from old age pension isn't that much. Then I checked my husband's bank account. Seeing frequent transfers to the parents-in-law, things clicked into place. Furthermore, James, you should moderate your gambling. I continued. He looked at me. You were at the casino almost every day. How did you know that? If you're going to gamble without your wife noticing, at least do it far from home. I had thought he was working late every night, but I was wrong. The supermarket where I always shop is next to a casino. Having seen my husband entering and exiting the casino, I had my suspicions. When I asked someone who seemed to be a regular there, they said he was in the store almost every day. My husband had become a full-blown gambling addict. Continuing a married life with such a person would lead to my ruin. I insisted on the divorce, paying no mind to their disappointment. Seeing the once assertive parents-in-law, now dejected, felt satisfying. I've got your signature. Goodbye, then. I packed my things and left the house immediately. After the divorce, I started working as a full-time employee. The work was complex, and there was a lot to learn so it was tough at first. However, living without having to worry about home and only caring for myself felt liberating. I even thought, why didn't I do this sooner? Forgetting about my husband and parents-in-law, I enjoyed my life. Jennifer, why are you here? It was a year after the divorce when James, looking disheartened, appeared at my workplace. There had been no contact since the divorce, so why reach out now? 
I thought of ignoring him, but it wasn't feasible with him coming to my workplace. I explained the situation to my co-workers and took early leave to talk with James. I couldn't invite him home, so I reluctantly met him at a cafe near my workplace. Please, I can't pay back the debt anymore. James bowed his head, as if rubbing it against the table. The debt keeps increasing, and no one will help me. You're earning as a full-time employee now, right? Help me. James pleaded with me, his face a picture of misery. Dad and Mom also say they want you to come back. The parents-in-law probably hoped I would return to work like a slave for them again. Why do you need me? Dad and them can't live like this anymore. Huh? I don't have any money, and I can't borrow anymore, so I can't send them anything either. Both the parents-in-law and James, despite repaying debts, apparently can't reduce their standard of living. Well then, why don't you live within the means of what you get from the old age pension? That's why I'm asking you for help. Dad and them are living on debts too. What? Borrowing beyond the old age pension? From predatory lenders? That's why I'm really in trouble. Please, Jennifer. Looking at James' pitiable state, I felt no sympathy. This was the consequence of how he had treated me all this time. If you come near me again, I'll call the police. I said just that and stood up from my seat. You can't even pay for your coffee, right? I'll pity you enough to cover that. James' dazed face was almost comically pathetic. To cut ties with James completely, I changed my mobile phone number and moved house. Luckily, a vacancy opened up at a different branch of my workplace, so I decided to take the opportunity to transfer. Since then, it seems my husband was fired from his job. The parents-in-law had indeed borrowed money from a seriously predatory lender. The collection calls even reached James' company, leading to his dismissal once the company found out. He was on the verge of bankruptcy, burdened with debts he had no way of repaying. To think, he fell so far just a year after our divorce. He's a stranger to me now, so it doesn't matter. Now, I live 200 miles away from James. Being in a new place with no acquaintances, living alone was honestly intimidating. But then, one day at work, I had a conversation with a male colleague who was also a full-time employee, and found out we both had a history of divorce, which sparked our connection. I'm getting remarried. He's a single father with a daughter. Now his child even calls me mom. Mom, let's play house. Okay. I never imagined such warmth and happiness. To protect my current happiness, I'm determined to stay vigilant and work hard. I no longer look back at the past. I look forward and enjoy my life. After being oppressed by James, I will live my life solely for myself from now on.